Okay, so last uh, last lecture or video, I mean, we had uh, looked at um, elastic behavior, and you know, we said that you stretch something out and you let it go, and it goes back. In fact, what we had looked at was Hooke's law, um, and what I want to explore a little bit is more what that elasticity means. So, in fact, this elastic band is a good example. You stretch it out, and you let it go, and it returns to its original geometry. <clears throat> So what we had seen was this. We looked at stress-strain curve, and we said that most materials have a linear region initially. Now this elastic band we'll explore later is actually more non-linear, but it, it illustrates the point of elasticity. So what I want to explore is what elasticity really means. Okay. So, what is elastic deformation? <clears throat> I think that the explanation that we had right here is pretty reasonable. It's intuitive. We could say that the sample returns to its original geometry. Uh, when we unload it, right? Uh, upon unloading. That's fairly intuitive. The other thing we could do is we could look at this uh, stress-strain behavior and say, well, if we load the sample up to a point and it's still in the elastic region, if we then unload, we would expect to get back to zero stress and zero strain. So we could say then that the strain is recovered. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write that in orange. I'll tell you why in a second. Recoverable. Because often elastic strain is referred to as recoverable strain. They're used synonymously. Okay, so that's a fairly good explanation. I think it's intuitive. The, the final thing I want to look at, though, is could we give an atomic explanation for this? We've got a couple of atoms. You know, what does it mean if we apply a stress to um, this this paper clip, right? I you know I, I bend it or I, I, I put this paper clip onto some paper, and I take it off, and it looks to be the same geometry as when it started. What does that tell us that has happened to the atoms inside that paper clip? I think that it's not a large stretch of the imagination to to say that it must mean the atoms also return to their original positions. Upon unloading. Uh, upon unloading, there we go. <clears throat> and in fact, it's that explanation there that I'd like to explore in a little bit more detail. And I'd like to do that by considering, we could, uh, modeling atoms as um, a couple of hard spheres. So what I'm trying my, my best to uh, do here is to sketch out uh, a sphere. So I'm going to try to shade this in, as you know I like to do. So it looks like it's popping out of the page. So there you go. That's not too shabby. Hey, I'm not an artist, but that uh, looks like it. You could believe per perhaps that's a, a circle. I mean a sphere. Not a circle. It's a sphere. And so I'll duplicate that. And there we go. We've now got... <clears throat> um, couple of hard spheres and I'm going to draw a little spring between them. So that is a spring holding together these two hard spheres. And so what this is, of course, is it's a model. It's a mechanical model of, it's a mechanical model, give myself a little bit of space here, a mechanical model of, oops, I'll leave that a mechanical model of the atoms undergoing elastic uh, behavior, elastic behavior. Okay, so this is a mechanical model. And, and what the spring is doing is it's modeling whatever the net force is between atoms. 
Okay. The last thing I'm going to do with this little sketch is I'm going to actually dimension here the space between the atoms. And that is going to be called, for historical reasons, R. Okay, that is the, I'll give you the formal name, it's called the interatomic spacing. I appreciate it can be frustrating because we're using an R here for spacing between two atoms and the atoms have a radi have their own radii, right? So you might get confused between radius and interatomic spacing. But remember from context, if you know we're talking about interatomic spacing, R is going to refer to the distance between the nuclei. And it's it's an unfortunate bit of history, I guess. Um, it comes from, from physics, so you don't blame the physicists. Well, don't blame the physicists. My father's a physicist. But that's what's used, and so we got to deal with it. Um, for this course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promise you or try uh, my very best to use capital R for radius, but from context, I do hope that you will know the difference. <clears throat> so that's interatomic spacing, and <clears throat> what we can now do, that we've got this little crude mechanical model, is we can, we can plot now the force, the interatomic force, I'll write that in so it's clear. Interatomic force. And we can plot that against the interatomic spacing, R. And what we'll find is there's, there's some force that has to hold things together. We're going to explore later in the course what that is, but the curve for that looks something like this. And so this is the attractive force. So attractive is positive here. And this is repulsive, pushing them apart. So, you know, there has to be something that opposes that, otherwise everything would just collapse down infinitely close. So there has to be something that's pushing them apart, and thankfully there is. And it's this force that picks up very rapidly at the really close spacing. When the atoms get really close together, they get close enough that the electrons around the atoms start to see each other and repel. So what we're actually most interested in is the sum of the attractive and the repulsive forces. Let me label that repulsive. So what we are interested in here is the sum of these two, and the sum of these two looks something like this. I'm trying my best to sketch this. It follows that very closely. So that is the net interatomic force, which is of course what we are most interested in because that's what's telling us really what the atoms are feeling in this little model here. Right? These two atoms at rest, the net force should be zero. In fact, let's look at that. Right here, when they're at rest, or they're at equilibrium, the net force equals zero. Right? Net force is zero. Well, what does that also tell us? Well, it tells us there must be a special value of R. In fact, that value of R has to be the distance between the atoms at rest, or at equilibrium. And so we, in fact, define R as the special value of R, R0, which we call the uh, equilibrium interatomic spacing. Okay, now why is all this important? Well, here it is. This is all important because you can see now that if we look closely at the curve here, in this region here, very close to r equals to r naught, the curve looks almost like a straight line. So if we take the tangent to that curve, or the slope there, close to r equals r naught, we could also write that mathematically as the first derivative of that curve, df by dr. Well, that slope is something that should be kind of familiar to us. It's essentially we're looking at the relationship between force and displacement. And we did that macroscopically and then we came up with a spring constant. So it's almost like we've now got a little, a tiny little spring constant for these hard spheres connected by a spring. So that makes a bit of sense. But what we're also doing is we're saying, well, this was our model for how a material behaves. We know if I stretch this elastic band, I see 
this is not elastic. This paperclip. If I if I deform this a little bit and move it just a little bit, I must be moving atoms in there. Okay, we're just talking about small disturbances. We're not talking about you know taking and put it on a book and you know it, 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 that that's something else. We're going to explore that in another video. But right now we're just talking about little disturbances when it's still elastic. <clears throat> so when they're still elastic. There's some kind of a relationship between force, in fact, we could apply a certain force and observe the resulting displacement. So the conclusion, which I hope is not a big stretch of your, your imagination or your understanding, is that in fact, there's a relationship then between the Young's modulus, this is the Young's modulus, okay, and this interatomic force separation curve. And the relationship is in fact this. It's that Young's modulus is directly proportional to the first derivative of the interatomic force separation curve at r equals to r naught. And that is actually an important result. Why? Because, I'm going to give it a little box because it's kind of an important conclusion. That is important because it tells us <coughs> It tells us that the Young's modulus then depends only on the type of atoms. Okay, it depends only on the type of atoms you have, not what you've done to the material. Only on type of atoms. There's another way of stating that that you, you may come across, and it's this that the Young's modulus is structure independent. Structure, in fact, if you can permit me, I'm gonna, because it's so commonly used, I'm actually gonna write it out in this my orange color, so you realize this is very specific usage. Um, oh my, let me correct this. Structure independent, I got excited. Independent. Let me tell you just what that means. So it's structure independent, and that means we can make changes to the um, ex example, um, small changes to say that even the chemistry or the composition of an alloy. What you would probably in high school call concentration, which is really equivalent here. Do not change the Young's modulus. Nor does other stuff that we'll talk about later, like strengthening. So we'll see that you can dramatically increase the strength of, of a metal alloy but you will not change the Young's modulus. Why? Because it's structure independent. Because at the end of the day, the Young's modulus only depends on the type of atoms that you have. And if you haven't changed the type of atoms, you won't change the Young's modulus. Oh, it's so beautiful. All right, thank you very much.